Okay, today we're gonna to continue and actually finish our four part series of programs titled Zigzag to Ziklag. And this fourth part has the title of Elohim shows unconditional love when conditions are bad. Elohim shows unconditional love when conditions are bad. We saw in the first pro program that Elohim shows unconditional love when conditions are good. The good condition was David had just finished killing Goliath and putting the Philistines to flight. And Elohim showed his unconditional love at that period of time. Our second program, we talked about persecution can cause us to zigzag to ziklag. And we saw that David was persecuted relentlessly by King Saul. And he started to zigzag because instead of keeping his eyes focused on God Almighty, he started to seek for peace from a prophet, Samuel the prophet. Then he sought peace from Jonathan the prince. Then he sought peace from Ahimelech the priest, but neither the prophet nor the prince, nor the peace could give him peace because he wasn't seeking peace from the prince of peace. So he continued to zigzag, not focusing on God, not walking by faith, instead walking by sight. I see this dude coming after me for the fifth time. I see this dude coming after me for the sixth time. I see this dude coming after me for the seventh time. I am tired of running. I need some peace. So what happens? He finally finds peace. And this is in quotes. He finally finds peace when he went to King Achish of Gath. And Gath was the headquarters of the Philistines. So he sought peace and he found peace in quotes. But as we saw in our third program, peace can cause us to war. Because David hit rock bottom when he got to Ziklag because he went and found peace, in quotes, with this king, Achish of Gath, whose land was uh, the land of the Philistines. And he said, I am going to now fight against the Israelites on behalf of the Philistines. A complete 180 degree turn fighting for the Israelites against the Philistines as he was walking by faith, but then 180 degree turn as he started to fight against the Israelites on behalf of the Philistines because he was no longer walking by, by faith, he was walking by sight. I see this dude coming to get me. So he was willing to go to war because he found this false peace from Saul and from the armies of Saul, other Israelites. Now we can't, you know, like really condemn him too much. How many of us, if we have our brothers and sisters in the flesh or our brothers and sisters who used to be in the faith and they start pursuing us and persecuting us, we might get a little bit upset at them too and want to fight back at them. You remember, I told you that I have my hit list. Well, some of those people on the hit list were members of the body of Christ. And it's kind of ironic that uh, I was in contact with one of these people recently, so they're no longer on my hit list. <laughs> but so I can identify with David. And I zigzagged a bit because obviously we don't need to have a hit list. We need to have a forgiveness list. <laughs> but uh, I'm still human. So that anger really rose up in me and it took a while to dissipate. So that was a part of my zigzag that I zigzagged to in my life. Thankfully, God loves us unconditionally when times are good and when times are bad. So now we see that David joins the Philistines to fight against the Israelites. In 1 Samuel chapter 28, verses 1 through 2. 1 Samuel chapter 28 and verses 1 through 2. It says that the Philistines assembled their army to fight against Israel. Achish told David, you know, of course, that you and your men will go out with me into the battle. And David told Achish, no way, I serve the God of Israel. I will never fight 
my people and Yah's people. I will fight your people. Is that what he said? No, that's not what he said, unfortunately. In verse two, David told Achish very well, you will now see what your servant will do. You want to see proof that I'm faithful to you? He wouldn't say this next part, but that I've lost faith in the most high. You want to see that I'm faithful to you? Very well. I am going to do it with all of my heart. Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all of your heart. Of course, that does not apply to sin. <laughs> we should never sin with all of our heart, with any of our heart. But then Achish told David, very well, I'll appoint you as my permanent bodyguard. He convinced Achish that he was sincere because David was sincere, though he was sincerely wrong. So 1 Samuel chapter 29 now, in verses 1 through 2. This is 1 Samuel chapter 29, in verses 1 through 2. Here it says that the Philistines gathered all their troops at Apek, or Aphek, while Israel was camped at the spring in Jezreel. And the Philistine leaders were passing in review among the military units, and David and his men were among them in the rear with Achish. So notice that David and his men were there with the Philistine army, getting ready to fight against the Israelite army. And then some of the Philistine leaders were skeptical of David's sincerity. So they asked Achish to send David back to Ziklag. And notice David's reaction. His reaction should have been, okay, this is my out. I can get out of this situation that I put myself in because they told me to leave. Was that David's reaction? In 1 Samuel chapter 29, verses 6 through 8. 1 Samuel chapter 29 and verses 6 through 8. It says, Then Achish summoned David and told him, As surely as the Lord lives, you are trustworthy. And it seems good to me for you to campaign with me as a part of the army. Indeed, I've not found any evil in you from the time you came to me until now. But the leaders don't approve of you. So therefore, return and go in peace, so you do nothing to displease the Philistine leaders. Can you imagine even having that conversation? You're talking about the enemies of Yah, and you're saying that you're concerned about displeasing the Philistine leaders? That is insane. But that's a person who has zigzagged to Ziklag. He's not walking by faith. He's walking by sight. And he lost sight of the Most High, El Shaddai, the Almighty Elohim. And in verse 8, David asked Achish, what have you found in your servant? What's the problem? What is the problem? I'm doing everything I can to prove to you and everybody else that I'm on your side. What's the problem? What have you found in your servant from the time I came before you until this very moment? Or, <clears throat> excuse me, what have I done that I shouldn't go out and fight the enemies of your majesty? Man, oh man, oh man, that is a sad statement. I hope none of us ever, ever come to this point in our lives where we start to fight against our loving father and our loving savior, and as far as I'm concerned, I will do everything I can to make sure every one of us makes it. When I look at my brother Sunday, I say, man, we've been through so many battles together Sunday. Uh, man, I look forward to seeing you in the kingdom uh, with all my heart. Uh, and Brother Tim, man, also so many years together, so many battles we fought. Man, through some tough times too. Mm. And it's so good to see him every week. And I want to see him for eternity. And then Sister Charlene, who knows me the longest, even before my wife, Christiana. Ah, 
It's so good to see you, my sister. Bro. I guess. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> yeah, thank you, my dear. So it's been for Charlene and I 46 years now. 46 years. Well, 1978, because I remember when I came into knowledge of the truth when God chose me. Yeah, man. Union, New Jersey, then Atlanta, Georgia. And it's so good, especially when we saw her walk into services. We hadn't seen her for a little while, you know, but uh, so good to see her come back. And then, of course, my perfect wife, Christiane, <laughs> who's been with me uh, in the hardest of times. And now it's 37 years, pushing 38. And of course, I, I just know that throughout eternity, we're going to be together. And it's going to be so beautiful. So I'm going to do everything in my power to uh, lift up the name of Yeshua and just point us continuously to Yeshua and to our Father so that every one of us can make it into the kingdom. And the littlest ones, <laughs> Seth and Eli. Yeah, we're going to do everything we can to make sure you're in the kingdom too. We're going to support your parents to do everything we can to make sure we all make it, right? Okay, so if we ever zigzag to ziklag, let's pick each other up. Let's encourage each other. And notice the song that we sang, right? It says encourage yourself, but it's not encouraging yourself in the amount of money that you have. It's not encouraging yourself in the youth that you have. It's not encouraging yourself in the wisdom that you have. It's encouraging yourself in the Lord. That's what we need to do is everybody lifting up the name of Yeshua, the Messiah, so that we can all grow into his grace and knowledge until we all come into the full measure and stature of him, not being tossed to and fro, zigzagging back and forth to Ziklag, but growing into full maturity. That's what we need to do. So David is dismissed from his duties as a warrior with the Philistines against his enemies, the Israelites, and he journeys back to Ziklag. And this is where God begins to turn things around. We sang that song. My God will turn it around. And many, many times I've seen in my life that my God will turn things around. And he holds it all together. He's the alpha. He's the omega. He's in the middle. He holds it all together. So here we see in 1 Samuel chapter 30. Verses 1 through 6, 1 Samuel chapter 30, and verses 1 through 6. And this is going to be just to the first part of verse 6, and then we'll cover the last part. So 1 Samuel chapter 30, 1 through 6. When David and his men had come to Ziklag on the third day, they discovered that the Amalekites had invaded the south and burned Ziklag, to the ground. Now you remember that David had gone out and fought against the Amalekites and he thought that he had wiped them out. But obviously enough of them had uh, survived and maybe some other, the younger ones grew up. And so now it's like their chance to get revenge. And they had invaded the South and burned Ziklag to the ground. So again, the very place where David thought he finally found peace, it was burned to the ground. And that's exactly what's going to happen to us. If we stay in Ziklag and we think we have peace there, we're going to rest in peace in the lake of fire. That's what's going to happen. God will burn us to the ground. We will be ashes under the sole of people's feet, never to live again. And then in verse 2, the Amalekites had seized the women in it, but did not kill any, either small or great, instead choosing to take them captive. Verse three, David and his men came to the city and saw that it was burned with fire and realized that their wives and their children had been taken captive. Can you imagine how he felt? All of this time escaping by just a little, maybe tiny piece of his hair. Saul could have caught him by his hair and could have killed him, but he's just escaping, or as they say, by the skin of his teeth. 
which none of us have skin on our teeth. I hope. Now, I did hear, this is a little secret I probably wasn't supposed to tell, but I did hear that every now and then, Brother Eric bites Vanessa on the ear. Oh, <laughs> on both ears. <laughs> and so he might have some skin on his teeth. But anyway, um, so David is just escaping by the skin of his teeth. And here he goes out to battle against the Israelites, a fatal flaw. He comes back and sees fatality all around him. The place burned to the ground. Men killed. But then it says, David in verse four, and the people with him lifted up their voices and wept until they had no more power to weep. So again, can you imagine that? Just crying your heart out. Just crying and crying and crying until you can't cry anymore. You just maybe fall asleep. And I don't know if you've ever cried so hard where you get a headache. But that's happened to me before, just this pounding headache. And uh, that's how they were crying. It says in verse five, David's two wives, Ahinoam and Abigail, had been seized. Verse six, because the soul of all the people was grieved, each one for their wives and children, the people spoke of stoning David. And it great, greatly distressed David. You can imagine how David felt. These have been my boys, my posse, with me through thick and thin, and now they are turning against me. I have lost absolutely everything. I am all alone. Now that's a bad thing, but that's a good thing. Why is it a bad thing that he's all alone? Why is that a bad thing? Anybody? Yes. Defense. Defense? And what do you mean by that? So, I mean, he feels like he has enemies on every side. Mm -hmm. And being isolated probably won't be good for him physically. Right. So he has no defense. He's all alone, so he no longer has any defense. He's lost his faith in Elohim, Yah. He's lost his faith in the support of his 600 soldiers, his boys, his posse. Yeah. So he has nothing left. Yeah. No one to turn to. Right. So that's why it's bad. But why is it good? Yeah. That's right. Exactly. Yeah. Right. Sometimes when we're at the end of our rope, that's when we cry, not just crying, oh, woe is me, but we cry out to Yahweh for help. We never should get to that point where Yahweh is the last resort, because Yahweh should always be the first resort. Always the first resort. You know, sometimes you'll hear people say, well, the doctor said there's nothing else that they can do. So all we can do is pray. What do you mean all we can do is pray? That's what we should be doing all of the time. Forget the doctors. Yeah. We need to be praying always. Isn't that what the scripture says? Pray always. That's what we should be doing. It's never a last resort. It's always the first, second, third, 26, if 26 letters, alpha and omega, or innumerable amount of time. So it greatly distressed David. Let's see what David did. He's all alone. That's a bad thing, but it's a good thing. Let's see how things turned out. So finally, David hits rock bottom in every way. Everything David did failed, and now even his 600 loyal followers turned on him. David had no one to turn to except to the one who can turn things around. In David's darkest time, the light of the world turns on the light in David's world. So now we see in 1 Samuel chapter 30, verse 6, the latter part. It says, but in David encouraged himself in Yahweh his Elohim. Finally, finally, and it's never too late. As long as we have breath, if we repent, our God loves us unconditionally. When times are good, when times are bad, the love is the same. 
So David encouraged himself in Yahweh his Elohim. So how did David encourage himself in Yahweh his Elohim? David prayed. In 1 Samuel chapter 30, verses 7 through 8. 1 Samuel chapter 30, verses 7 through 8. David requested from Abiathar, the priest, please bring the ephod here to me. Please. I'm like begging you, pretty please, with cherries on top. Please. I have nowhere else to turn to except for the one who can turn things around. So please bring the ephod here to me. And Abiathar brought the ephod there to David, verse 8. And David inquired of Yahweh, asking, shall I go after this troop? Shall I overtake them? And Yahweh answered him, go, for you shall surely overtake and will without fail recover all. Now that's a promise that our Heavenly Father makes to us. No weapon formed against us will ever prosper. Greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. Be of good cheer, for he, Yeshua the Messiah, has already overcome the world. When he was resurrected from the dead to eternal life, that's when he was declared to be the Son of God. Everything else he did before then could be questioned. Raising Lazarus from the dead, question. This woman with the issue of blood for 12 years, question. The man who had a lunatic, who was a lunatic, who had, I think it was 18 demons in him when they ran into the pig, healing him, question. Everything can be questioned, except he was resurrected from the dead to eternal life and declared to be the son of God. That's who we have living inside of us. We have nothing to fear because our God holds it all together. He's the alpha, he's the omega. He has written our story. All we have to do is follow his word. He, Yeshua, is the light. He is the way. He is the truth. He is everything that we need. So listen to the promise, stand on the promises of Yah. And if we do that, so that's with our moms, with our heart, we say, we love you, we trust you, we embrace you. And then our actions, we are gonna walk the talk. We're gonna walk by faith. It takes faith to believe. You didn't stop Saul. He pursued me until I just lost faith. I'm sorry about that. I'm asking you now, will you forgive me? I'm repenting. You are a merciful God. Please help me. Look at this desperate situation I'm in. Well, God loves us unconditionally. God's going to make everything work together for good with those whom he has chosen and those who love him. That's right. Amen. And so now he's ready to stand on the promise of God. God answers him and says, go, for you shall surely overtake the Amalekite army and will without fail recover all. So this is a powerful example of Elohim's mercy and grace. Mercy because he forgave him. Grace because he gave him power to recover all things. Mercy is us not receiving what we deserve. Grace is us receiving what we don't deserve. So let this sink in and then let us say hallelujah. hallelujah. Our God loves us unconditionally. He is merciful. He is gracious. And when he promises something, let's stand on the promise and let's walk it out. Let's walk by faith. No fear. He's not given us the spirit of fear. He's given us the spirit of power and of a sound mind. So Elohim always fulfills their word. Always. In 1 Samuel chapter 30, verses 9 through 10. 1 Samuel chapter 30, verses 9 through 10. So David went, he and the 600 men that were with him, and came to the brook Basor. Verse 10. But 200 stayed behind because they were too exhausted to go over the brook Besor. So you knew 
you know they had to be worn out. These are warriors. But they said, hey, we are just too exhausted. We're going to be a hindrance to you as opposed to a help. So we're going to stay behind. It wasn't because of fear. They were just exhausted. Have you ever been too tired where you can't even get up and move? I was so tired yesterday because <laughs> I was moving rocks outside and, and lots and lots of rocks, heavy rocks. And uh, I was too exhausted to get off the couch <laughs> and go to bed. So I slept in the couch for a while, slept on the couch for a while. That's sometimes how exhausted we can be. So it wasn't because they were fearful. They weren't punks. They just were exhausted. So nevertheless, David and the other 400 men pursued the Amalekites. Now, David defeats the Amalekites and recovers everything he lost. Plus, he took riches that the Amalekites left behind. So when he went to battle, he chased them away. He killed some, chased them away. And all of the riches that they left behind, they even took that stuff. So look now at how David, again, after all of this, he becomes a man after God's own heart. Make no mistake, David was not a man after God's own heart at some points in his life. And neither has any one of us at all points in our life had the heart of God. At some point, all of us begin to zigzag and all of us, I'm sure, at some point have hit our ziklag. But thankfully, God is merciful. He's gracious. He loves us unconditionally. And he will turn our lives around. And he's going to even initiate it, take us through some stuff. So that we, as he's seeking to turn us around, we will turn to him. It's not us turning to him first. It's always God initiating the process. But we look now at how David again becomes a man after God's own heart. This is quite amazing, and it is such a beautiful ending to the story or to the historical event. So in 1 Samuel chapter 30, verses 21 through 24, 1 Samuel chapter 30 and verses 21 through 24. After the victory, David came to the 200 who were too exhausted to follow him, verse 22. But every evil and worthless man of the 400 men who went with David revolted and said, because they did not go with us, we will not give them anything from the spoils that we have seized. The only thing we're going to give these sorry. <laughs> we're only going to give them back their wives and their children. They're getting nothing else. So let them take them and get out of here. We don't want to have anything to do with them anymore. That's what you call a hit list. 400 people said, we have a hit list against these 200 who forsook us and let us go out to battle. We did all the hard work. And then you telling me to give them what we worked so hard, risked our lives for? No way. But look at how our father describes them in verse 22 again. But every evil and worthless man, that's how my father looked at me when I had my hit list. I'm going around thinking, vengeance is mine, thus saith the glen. <laughs> ah, how foolish, how foolish. And I'm so thankful our father is so patient, so merciful, so kind. And I'm so thankful that he's still in the process of helping me to learn how to forgive those who have so deeply hurt me. All right, so it says, they are evil and worthless. And we see the evilness and the worthlessness of people that have that kind of heart because they said they did not go with us, so we're not going to give them anything. Except, go ahead, take your wives, take your children, and get out of here. Now, verse 23. But David said, my brothers, he's pleading with them. We've been through thick and thin. My brothers, you shall not do so with that which we 
have captured. Is that what the scripture says? No. My brothers, you shall not do so with that which Yahweh has given to us. Always recognize where our help comes from. Always recognize where our blessings come from. Never get too big for your britches or your britches will be burned. My brothers, you shall not do so with that which Yahweh has given us. For he has protected us and he has delivered us or delivered into our hand the company that came against us. It's all about Yahweh. I will not listen to you in this matter. And sometimes a leader has to lead against all odds. So the scripture says, seek wise counsel, right? Because in the multitude of counselors, there's safety. Not if they're fools. <laughs> if they're fools, if they're evil and worthless, and yes, we do have to make that judgment, take the beam out of our own eye, but surely after that, if there's a splinter in somebody else's eye, take it out and love. All right, don't just leave the splinter in their eye. And that's not being self-righteous. That's being God-righteous. You want to help your brothers and sisters who are having a problem. These people had a problem. So he said, eh, not hearing it. I will not listen to you in this matter. I don't care if there's 400 against one. I'm the leader. I now have God's spirit filling me, animating me, and I'm telling you what Yah says. This is the heart of Yah. So those of you who went down to battle with me shall have a portion of the spoil and those who stayed behind because they were exhausted, not because they were punks, not because they were fearful. They fought with us through thick and thin. The one time when they're exhausted and you want to kick them to the curb? No, I will not allow that. You need to have the heart of Yah as well. And the heart of Yah says, be merciful, be gracious, be kind, love people unconditionally. So those of you who went down to the battle with me shall have a portion of the spoil and those who stayed behind because they were too exhausted. They also shall have a portion of the spoil. Everyone will share alike. Everyone will share alike. So David becomes a man after God's own heart by showing unconditional love to the 400 who went with him and to the 200 who stayed behind. Isn't that beautiful? That is truly beautiful. And again, I hope that whoever I have sinned against, whoever I have offended, that they don't have a hit list <laughs> against me, that they actually have a prayer list, a mercy list, a grace list, and I'm on that. They're praying for me. They're willing to forgive me. And they're willing to actually help me. That is the heart of love, the heart of God, the heart of our father, the heart of our elder brother, the Messiah, Yeshua. So in conclusion, here's a reminder of the main point from each of the four parts of this sermon series. Number one, Elohim shows unconditional love when conditions are good. Elohim empowered David to defeat Goliath and the Philistines. He was walking by faith, not by sight. Persecution, point number two. Persecution can cause us to zigzag to ziklag. Saul persistently persecuted David, and David fled to a prophet, a priest, and a prince in pursuit of peace. And then the third point was peace can cause us to war. Finally, David found peace, in quotes, with Achish, the Philistine king, and he was wanting to go to war against his, quote, enemies, the Israelites, who were not his enemies at all. And then point number four, Elohim shows unconditional love when conditions are bad. Elohim, even when David was at Ziklag, at rock bottom, all alone, when David prayed to him, God gave him strength to believe, to walk 
by faith and not by sight, to stand on the promise of Yah. And so Elohim empowered David to defeat the Amalekites, to take their spoils, and he then had the heart of God again. I'm going to share the spoils with everybody, those who fought and those who didn't fight because they were too exhausted. I will show mercy to them as Yah showed mercy to me. I will forgive them. I will also show grace as Yah has shown grace to me. I will give to them what they don't deserve, the spoils. That is the heart of our loving father and our loving elder brother, the Messiah Yeshua. Let us love in the same manner.